Hey. Hey. Right. Brooke. The piano portion, my favorite part. Oh, all right. Uh, <laughs> well, we get the end of the show. We can do it then. That's right. We'll hear it again. We'll hear it again. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of astronomy outreach for January the 15th, the Sunday night astronomy show. Hey. Kurt, that's what we do, Kurt. Hey. <laughs> hey. <laughs> My name is Chris Kerwin. I'm the creator and admin of the social media channels known as Astronomy by the Bay. I'm an amateur astronomer as well and a member of the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Hey. Hey. Uh, first of all, <laughs> let's uh, introduce our two regular co-hosts of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, Mr. Mike Powell from the PFO Observatory here in beautiful St. John. Mike, good evening. Hey. 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 And our other regular co-host here on the program, Mr. Paul Owen from the Moonshadow Observatory hey. in beautiful Hampton, New Brunswick. Hey. Oh. All right. Um, on tonight's episode of the Sunday Night Astronomy Show, uh, the winter night sky can be a real treat to enjoy. Now, constellations like Orion and Ursa Major stand out proudly, but there are many others as well with many interesting stories and legends behind them. Now, luckily, uh, there is a wonderful storyteller in our part of the country that has graciously accepted our invitation to join us each month to discuss some of those. And his name is Mr. Kurt Nason, who is here with us this evening. Window number four here. Uh, hey. <laughs> Kurt is a local veteran of our hobby, an active member in the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada, both provincially and nationally for many years. And he also has an asteroid named after himself. Yes. So, very well. Yes. Uh, Kurt is going to present a discussion around the dog days of winter. Dog Nights of Winter, he suggested. Uh, constellations of Canis Major and Canis Minor. Welcome back to the program, Kurt. Thank you, but asteroid? <laughs> Is that wrong? That may, well, it makes more sense. I thought it was a steroid. <laughs> so, <laughs> even better. Okay. I Kurt. thought you were looking like you were pumped up. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, we'll be talking about the doggies. Okay, perfect. That's what matters. Uh, also tonight, Donald Bud will return with another Find the Doctor Target of the Week, and Paul will be presenting another interesting Rosanna's Fun Fact segment. I'm going to provide you with a quick look at the week ahead in our evening sky. If we get any evening sky this week, uh, and we will uh, we'll also have your wonderful photo submissions to share as well. Uh, so this is a family-friendly interactive live broadcast. So for those of you joining us from my YouTube channel or Facebook page, uh, we are happy to try and answer all of your astronomy questions here in real time as well. And of course, we'd like to welcome back all of those who have been joining us through the local Rogers TV network. Thank you for your support. So guys, let's get started then with tonight's program and a story or two about the dog days of winter. Okay. Who let the dogs out? Mm -hmm. Somebody's already saying that. <laughs> that was coming. Are you still there? I'm here. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. There. Is that up? There we go. Ta-da. Okay. The dog nights of winter. So take off of the dog days of summer. Okay. So here's the uh, general area of the sky up there where we have the dogs. There's Orion, as we talked about last month. Now, the dogs here, we have the Canis Major, the great dog, and Canis Minor, the lesser dog, or big and little. And, and we have a bunch of other ones up here around it. Uh, you have Taurus the bull up there, and Monosaurus the unicorn, and Lepus the hare down here, and Columba the dove. And up in here, there's uh, Puppus, which is the back of the, well, originally it was part of the Argo Nevis, um, one of Ptolemy's constellations, but they broke that one up into three smaller ones because it was such a huge one. So Puppus is the, uh, the stern or the, uh, the deck that's at the, back of the, at the back of the boat. Now in mythology, there's not a whole lot about the dogs here, uh, except that they call those uh, Ryan's hunting dogs. These were, um, he's been known for, for a long time, just like Ryan. And being a hunter, he, well, hunters often take dogs out with them. Now the big dog here, Canis Major, it does look like a dog. It's one of those few constellations that looks like it's supposed to look like. But its bright star there, Sirius, is the brightest star in the night sky. 
and it's also the closest naked eye star that uh, we can see here from from Canada. And here up here in Canis Minor, there's another bright star up here, Procyon, which is the eighth brightest star. And now in mythology, that's pretty much what it was. They were the dogs, and some people say that uh, the great dog here is, uh, is up looking at Orion, uh, waiting for waiting for his orders. But then they also have the hair down in here. So it looks like the dog's just watching the hair, but the hair's the rabbit is doing its uh, frozen act. It figures if I don't move, they can't see me. And for many creatures in the animal world, that is, that is true. Uh, the little dog up here, where you, they've got up in the back of uh, Monosterus there. It looks like a circus dog and pony show in there. Um, one thing, uh, Sirius has been probably even more famous than the constellation itself. There have been uh, many, many cultures that have really noticed that star and they've had uh, legends built around that. And particularly, and they say that the name might even come from, from Egypt. Uh, four or 5,000 years ago, uh, along the Nile, that people noticed that the uh, Sirius would rise, the helical rising, just before the sun. And about two or three weeks later, the Nile would flood its banks. And being the people that uh, they lived along the Nile and the, the, the flooded Nile could be, it brought the, the rich soil for their farming, but it also they were flooding the banks, it could flood them out. So if they got this heads up by seeing Sirius uh, just rising just before the sun rises, I give them an idea that after years they figured out, let's move away from the Nile, we can be safe and then come back once the, the floods go down, then we'll have that rich soil for our farming. And uh, there's another old legend from mythology, um, two or three about dogs, but there's one, uh, one dog called Lelaps. It was a very fast dog, and it was given by uh, the goddess of the dawn to um, one of Mercury's sons, because she had a thing for him. This dog was very, very fast, and they had it, uh, put it up in a, a race against the fox. And the two of them took off in the race, and the race went on for a long, long time, neck and neck. And as Zeus watching the race here, I think he got bored or he decided to end it there. So he took the dog and he put him up in the sky to commemorate him for his uh, fast running like that. And there's not, uh, these two dogs and Lepus and Orion Taurus up here, these are all part of Ptolemy's, uh, uh, he wrote the Albages in the second century and he had 48 constellations listed there, which included Argo Mavis. Now the other ones around in here, um, Monoceros and Columba, they do not, uh, they were not part of that one. Those ones were devised by uh, Petrus Plantius back around 1600, give or take about 10 years there. And there's really not much for any mythology associated with these, although Columba, they say it could be the, um, the dove that Noah had let go to see to check out the skies after that. And you can look at the Argo Navis here, the part of it, you look at that as being Noah's Ark. So that might tie in somewhat with uh, the unicorn up here. If you're a, a fan of the Irish Rovers and their song, the unicorn. So we do have Noah's Ark there. We've got the unicorn up in here and we've got the dove part of it. So we can tie that one in with uh, like a new mythology. Somebody's got to make these up. All right, so. The big dog here, in, in addition to the brightest star in the sky, he's got three of them up in here that are in the top 50. And there's only one really bright star there, Gomeza, which is the other two, there's only two stars that are really visible there in Canis Minor. Looks more like the wiener dog, but uh, just said Procyon is the eighth brightest one there. So let's visit up here in Canis Major, the big dog. Now, all these little yellow circles in here, these are open clusters. See the NGC numbers and there are four or five of the uh, Messier numbers up in here as well. And here's the winter Milky Way. Runs up from the stern here of the, of the deck and running up across this way. This winter Milky Way, so we're looking at an arm of the Milky Way away from the sun, in the opposite direction. And along the Milky Way arms, that's where you're going to see star formation. That's where all the clouds would be for forming the groups of stars in there. So it's, uh, Really no surprise that we're going to see all of these open clusters in here. And several of these are brighter than uh, eighth magnitude. So they might look like little fuzzy patches and binoculars. 
Uh, there's, and again, there's the five or six or so of the um, Meze objects in here. Now we'll visit a few of those. And I like to look at this in a, in a different sense. Here you got a big dog. Now here's the constellation border here of Canis Major. There's a border here for, for Puppis and Monocers up in here. If anybody that's got a big dog and you look out in the backyard, you're going to see little puddles and stuff like that all over the place. <laughs> and if you're not a very good dog owner, um, they're going to stay there for a while. And Ryan's really a poor one because his big dog here has been going in the neighbor's yards. There's some up here in the, in the unicorn's yard, a bunch of them down here. Now, and you can know in here, this is the deck. So the dog's doing it on the neighbor's deck. That's fairly <laughs> impolite. Although it might be okay here because this is the, the stern. So this is the deck on the back of the ship. <laughs> and the raised deck that's on the back of the ship, they have a specific name for that. It was called the poop deck. So it's perhaps quite well to have the uh, all the uh, little clusters in there like that. And we've got the three stars in there. There's Mirzam, Sirius, uh, for Wizen, and Adhera. So Adhera, that is the 23rd brightest star in the sky, or 22nd, depending on what list you look at. This magnitude 1.5, where Sirius up here is minus 1.4, much, much brighter than any other star, more than three times brighter. Wizen in here would be the um, like 38th brightest star. And Mirzam up in here. It's just a little bit brighter than uh, Polaris, and they both make, barely make the top 50. And so up in here, we've got M50 from the Messier list. Right? Underneath Sirius in here, there's M41, which is a really nice one to pick out. There's a couple up here that are just over the line in, in the Papas, M46 and M47, and M50 up in here is in part of Monoceros. I'll talk about those very briefly. So M41, the open cluster, all right, down here is about four degrees. So here's the Telrad uh, sites that you have. These are four degrees wide. So you can see there's Sirius there and just under four degrees, just down below it. So when you see uh, the big dog up there, up to the south, just drop down right directly below it, less than a binocular width, and you'll find M41 in there. And it's uh, magnitude 4.5, so it's it's easy to pick up. And I've heard of uh, read that you know people can see that one with the naked eye. And there are a lot of colorful stars in that one there, and it's uh, fairly big, uh, bigger than the moon. Now, M47, which is uh, another one of the open clusters, a little bit smaller than M41, but uh, fairly bright, still at magnitude 4.4. And now we get Sirius here, and this isn't directly across or isn't directly to the east. It's uh, sitting maybe about eight degrees above the eastern line down from there. We can see it's maybe uh, 10 degrees from Sirius coming over in that direction. You see M47 in here. And right beside it, and looking maybe even a little bit better, is M46, which is this one. Now, this would be a great one to see in the telescope. It's uh, quite a bit wider, or 27 arc minutes there, still a little bit smaller than the other ones, but it's a neat one to see. There's a cluster there, it looks like it's got more stars into it. But with this one, you see something there that looks a little bit off. That's a planetary nebula that you can see within that star cluster, although it's not actually part of it. It's actually in the foreground. Uh, star clusters, open clusters, seldom last more than, uh, say, a, a billion years and any star that's going to be a, an open it's going to give you a planetary nebula it'd be one roughly the size of the sun or maybe a bit bigger and over a billion years that's never going to age enough to uh, blow up into and form a planetary nebula like that so that one can't be in that part of the cluster you know it's in the foreground and m50 another open cluster up here in monoceros now this one has a good way to find it. You get Sirius and you go up uh, toward Procyon up there and make a beeline toward it. And about 40% of the way from Sirius mm -hmm. to Procyon and a tad to the right, you'll see the M50 in there. It says uh, smaller than the other ones and a little bit dimmer, but you can pick it up. It's, a, it's still a binocular object. 
particularly if you have a, a nice dark sky or mediocre sky and, and large binoculars. And, and another one here to pick up, and this is a good time to get it either this year or next couple of years. This is the PUP, and this is the Series B, uh, companion of Sirius and they're orbiting each other. And back in the 1840s, uh, Frederick Bessel was the first guy that uh, was able to measure a actual distance to a star using the parallax method. You'd notice that the wobbling back and forth Siri of Sirius told him that he had a, it had a companion, but nobody could see it. And it wasn't until, and, it, and obviously the way that Sirius was moving, it was fairly dense and people still couldn't see it. So maybe it was just too close or maybe not bright enough. And it was in 1862 that Alvin Clark uh, was a, one of the uh, top lens makers making great telescopes back at that time. And he was testing out an 18 and a half inch uh, refractor uh, that he had made for an observatory. And he, like, he tested it out on Sirius and he saw that star right beside it. And where that's the dog star, they nicknamed that the pup. And they discovered that's uh, a white dwarf star. But of course, it wasn't until quite a bit later before they knew what a white dwarf was. So this is a, an old star that had uh, gone through its, its um, nuclear fuel and shrunk down into the white dwarf star after it blew up the uh, outer part of the star. So it's about the size of the Earth. And here's the orbit. It's a 50-year orbit. And sometimes it's in close around here, you're never going to see it. And um, it gets up around here where it is now, where 2022, 2023, we're pretty much at the farthest from that, about 10 arc seconds. So this would be a good year or next year, or maybe even the year after to go out and try for that. Now, what you're going to need is a very steady sky because the way that the Sirius twinkles there, uh, it's, it's flashing very, very high and it doesn't get up very high in the sky. So to get a very, very steady night in, in the sky like that, it'd be a good time to try for it. Uh, you want some clean optics and of course you want to be able to pick up more magnification. And that's where it really comes in to have a, a steady sky like that. And you need a, a lot of magnification to pick that one up. Now there is another trick um, to make a, an occulting disc or an occulting bar for that. And what that would be, you could take, you could take a, a piece of wire or some people would take a piece of tin foil and cut a very thin line along that. Tin foil is pretty good because it's not going to have a, a fuzzy or jagged edge on it. And you take the barrel off your eyepiece and tape that to the, the field stop. The field stop might be just a little bit below that if you can figure out where it is. But let's tape it on there and then put the barrel back on. And then you can turn the eyepiece and the focuser so that the that um, calding disc, the calding uh, strip there would block out the light of Sirius and makes it a lot easier to see you know, the pup in there. And you notice where it is, it's uh, roughly about a north is up here. So it's a little bit uh, north of, of east. So it'd be looking in that direction. And of course you have to know what direction you're seeing in your eyepiece, pick that up. Now it turns out that the um, Rigel as a companion as well. It's not a white dwarf, but it's uh, the distance between those two separations about 10 arc seconds as well. So if you want to test it out, see if you try Rigel first, and if you can get that one, then you maybe get a, a chance of seeing the pop here. If you can't see it on Rigel, Rigel's companion, you're not going to get it here. So I've, I've been meaning to do this for the past few years, and maybe this will be the year I do it. Maybe this will be the year I also look for the the horse at Nebula, but we'll see. All right, so this one to try out. Now here's Procyon, take a look at that. Now, there's only one deep sky object that's reasonably bright, and this one's uh, around eighth magnitude, NGC 2395. Okay. Now in this picture here, it looks like in this dog and pony show, the, the little dog there is bouncing a ball on top of his nose, and that's pretty much the, the way I'd look at it. Where a lot of people have a dog, they'll put a a dog biscuit on the dog's nose and then give him the sign and the dog will catch it in his mouth if he need it. Shame on people that do that. <laughs> okay, so Procyon. That name, well, serious, the name means uh, the scorcher, the scintillating one, because it's always flashing back and forth uh, like that, because it's very, very bright. 
And so usually down low, particularly in our, uh, in our sky, uh, where the seeing is not as good. And every year I'll have somebody asking me about uh, the, you know, the UFO they think they saw. I'm sure Chris, you get calls about it every year as well. Mm -hmm. And uh, people, you can see moving, you can see the flashing colors as the, uh, as the atmosphere breaks it up into the colors like that. But this one has the name of Procyon, which means before the dog. Now, if we think back to what I mentioned there before about the, uh, in Egypt in ancient times, they watch for the helical rising of Sirius rising just before the sun rises, the first time they can see it. Okay? And then they know that the, the Nile will be flooding its banks. Well, you get cloudy skies or poor seeing or something like that, or you have to miss it. You might not be able to see that. It might be several days or weeks after that before you can see Sirius. But if they added something else to tell them, they, hey, be heads up. That's what they use Procyon for. So here in New Brunswick, uh, Procyon now rises about 37 minutes before Sirius. Right? So if you get something like that, you've got to maybe a week and a half heads up before you can catch uh, Procyon in the sky just before the sun rises. You'll know that maybe in a week or so, they'll see serious there and that would give them the chance to, to move away. So I get thinking about it that I wonder if that's true. Right, so I looked it up on Stellarium and here's Cairo. And that was December 1st last year. There's Procyon and there's Sirius. And actually Procyon rises two minutes after Sirius from Cairo. Hmm. So what's going on there? Well, if you remember last you, uh, last month's talk on Orion, I showed you where Orion was in about 12,000 years. We don't only see the upper half of them due to precession of the equinox. So let's dial back our clock here about 4,000 years. And there's Cairo in about 2021 BCE. And here's the difference. Back then it rose 41 minutes before Sirius. Yes, sir. So the sky changes that way due to the precession of the equinox. That's cool. Yeah. Now, a few other things here. Look at some other areas that see it, and most of these are going to be dogs. <laughs> okay, so in the Romanian sky, they, well, different dogs here. They saw, and in here is a, a large mastiff. And then we got the little dog in here, the, the wiener dog. And I blew it up over here so you can see it a little bit better. So you just mainly you just see the two stars from, from uh, you can say, from suburban skies, Procyon and Gameza. That's a nice big hunting dog there. And there they call Sirius the morning star, which probably relates into uh, in, in Egypt when they're looking for the uh, Sirius to rise just before the sun. And uh, Chris, do you remember the name of the dog now? Oh. <laughs> I know the guy oh, Spike. The, yeah, I forget. Right. Spike and... Uh, hmm. give, you a, give you a hand. It rhymes with Chester. Oh, yeah. Okay, Chester. All right. Okay. Chester? And uh, one pointed out last week, last month as well, is in Jibwa, uh, to them, he was the winter maker. And over here is Procyon. Right? They don't mention Sirius down here. You have Procyon and Aldebra make the hands of, of the winter maker and rest them here in Orion. And there was another one mentioned last month that didn't put it here, was the arrow down here, bow and arrow. Right? This was the guy that was shooting the arrow at a deer. So this, one was, this area is called the deer slayer. The uh, Macedonian uh, people there in Greece, they saw these as two wolves. Maybe a big wolf and another wolf, or a bright wolf and a dim wolf. Up here you see that there's a Betelgeuse, they saw as a plowman. Up here, Aldebra was seen as a fox, and the rest of the, uh, the Hyades were seen as pigs. And there's oxen over here with Orion's belt. And scales down here, Libra, down around Rigel. And in Arab countries, this would be more recent, maybe uh, around the sixth century uh, CE. There was a, a tale of uh, a man or a woman here, Al Jaza, and she was uh, destined to be married to a guy called Suhail. And Suhail lived across the river here. So there's Milky Way, that was the river. She was living on this side. He was living on the other side with his two sisters, the Shira sisters. Maybe they were sisters of He-Man, if you remember those cartoons. Mm -hmm. 
we had kids from back in that time, which I did. And so Sirius was the one of the sisters, Proson is the other sister. And down in here, so Hale, that's the second brightest star in the sky. You know what that one is? The second brightest star in the sky? Yeah. For some reason, I've just forgotten it. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's cannabis. So it's brighter than Sirius. It's just it's dimmer than Sirius, but uh, brighter than Arcturus and Vegas. That's cannabis. I saw him there to be married, and he came over across the river on the night, day before their marriage. And for some reason, that evening, the night before they were to get married, she died. Now, there's no story of how she died, but fearing for his life, so Hale fled to the south. So he's down here now where, where Canopus is, Canopus. And his two sisters over here, uh, one of them, the Shira across the river, which is Al Shira Al, Al Abru, she decided to follow him. So she crossed the river and was in the process of following after her brother here. But the other sister up here, which is Procyon, she was a little bleary eyed uh, Shira or, or star. And she just spent her time crying her eyes out because uh, she was uh, very, very sad about uh, what happened to her. Her sister, her future sister, Vaughn, and her brother has run away, and her sister has left her as well. And so what's funny about this is that 15 years ago, Sirius was actually on this side of the Milky Way, up closer to uh, Procyon. And I checked that out today on uh, Stellarium, verified that. So over the 50,000 years, it's been moving in this direction. So all the stars are moving somewhat and somewhat uh, some will be moving in, uh, faster than the other ones. And this is not just the rotation of the galaxy. And so um, Sirius has moved a long way there in the 50,000 years. It's now on this side of the Milky Way. Now that I mentioned that, there's another star in here. This is at Hera. That's the one that's about the 22nd or 23rd brightest star. But about 4.6 million years ago, that was the brightest star in the sky. And it was magnitude minus four which is oh. the same as, as a modest brightness for Venus. But now it has moved away. It's now 440 light years from us. Mm -hmm. I found interesting this, uh, the absolute magnitude of this star. It's uh, right now it's 1.5, but the absolute magnitude is a measure that they have for stars to compare them all the same, at the same distance. That distance is 10 parsecs or 32.6 light years. So, and then here, here, if it get moved into uh, 32.6 light years distance, it would be magnitude 4.8. And that happens to be the same as the sun. If it get moved out to that distance, it doesn't mm. make sense. Mm. Oh yeah, it's moving, it's probably moving farther back. No, it's moving closer, it should be, should be brighter than that. I'm gonna have to check that one out. Hey, remind. <laughs> we'll move on to the next one. <laughs> hey, one more thing here about Sirius. Now, another thing that is quite famous for, here's daylight, right? Here's uh, this July 14th here from St. John at uh, 1, 10 p.m., so midday for us. And I've got rid of the uh, atmosphere on here, so just hold your breath. <clears throat> And we have the sun up here in Gemini. Now in the first day of summer, the sun would be just over in here. And it's been known for uh, maybe, maybe thousand, a couple thousand years or more, or might be just several decades. But people thought that the very, very hot days of summer were caused by the sun, but also Sirius being in the same part of the sky. Very bright star like that, uh, it really must be very, very hot. So the combined heat from those two is why summer was hot. This is called the dog star. So those very, very hot days in summer are called the dog days of summer. Mm. Right? So that's where that comes from. Now, we've got these two dogs up there in the sky in the wintertime. And when you get into January and February, you know that we're into some very, we can be into some very, very cold nights. So I think we can call these the dog nights of winter. Uh, now I know a guy, there's a guy in where I grew up uh, when I was a teenager, I was talking to him one time, and he was, uh, it was a very, very hot day, and he described the day as one of those days when dogs chase cats, and they're both walking. So I thought yeah. that is a very good 
definition of uh, the dog days of summer. So what would be a good definition of the dog days of winter? Well, it'll be one of those days when dogs stick to the fire hydrants. <laughs> 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 uh, okay. There you go. <laughs> there. Yeah. Wow. Kurt, you tell an, you tell an awesome story. <laughs> Somebody's got to make them up. <laughs> so the dog's name is uh, Leaky. Leaky. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and the other one's called Piddle. <laughs> Never be able to look at messy objects again between those stars and not yeah. think about little droplings all over the place. Yeah, that, that would be the, the, the messy objects. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> well, we'll do our best to change your mind here with Bono Bud soon. So okay. that's it. There you go. Thank you, Kurt. Appreciate that. Awesome. Yeah. Great, great to have you back on the show and great stories. Um, okay, um, let's move from there then maybe on to Bono Bud. Mike, you're up, sir. Find the screen to share here. Make sure I get the right one. So, the dog days of summer is a good little trivia nugget, Brad says. <laughs> show up there yet? There you go. Well, there he is. <laughs> He's just having a ball. <laughs> Take him to the dog days of winter. <laughs> <laughs> Our binocular target of the week this week by Barno Bud is, and Kurt talked about it, M41, the mini beehive. Uh, they must be working bees. <laughs> <It'll> be high. <laughs> All right. Messier 41, also known as NGC 2287, is an open cluster in the constellation Canis Major, sometimes referred to as the Little Beehive Cluster. It was discovered around 1654 and was perhaps known to Aristotle as far back as 325 BC. It lies about four degrees, and Kurt showed you that. It uh, almost exactly south of Cirrus and can easily be seen in binoculars. So how do I find it in the sky? Well, if you went out at 10 o'clock tonight and it was clear, which is not tonight, but oriented yourself about 160 degrees east-southeast and you looked up and saw Sirius, you come straight down and within that four degrees, you're going to find M41. Again, here's a closer look. They're straight down and you can't miss it. It should be a fuzzy patch for sure. What's it look like? Well, I don't think you're going to quite see what you see in this photograph, but that's a beautiful shot. Look at the different colors of the stars in there. Yeah, it's, nice. it's, it's quite a nice little uh, open cluster to look at. But in 10 by 50 binoculars, this is exactly what you're going to see. Uh, only not, in, yeah, maybe even in black and white. You just might not see the uh, orientation marks around the binoculars. But other than that, that's what you're going to see. Compared to the full moon, oh, it's at least a full moon in size, if, if nothing else. So it's a good size, easy target to see, nice and bright. You shouldn't have an issue uh, running out there and catching it on a good night. And waka, 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 waka. <laughs> <laughs> <all of> those. <laughs> Remember that wonderful game. <laughs> We're not going to target of the week by Bono Bud. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. I'll have to check with you next time to do a constellation talk to see what you're doing for Bino Bud. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. Thanks. Timely, both of them. Um, okay, how about Rosanna's fun fact? Yeah, you would ask that, wouldn't you? Okay, hang on here. Let me see if I get myself all set up. Remember, don't stick your tongue out on cold hydrants. Absolutely there. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Watch out where the skin go, and don't you eat that yellow snow. <laughs> I'm going to find out how I share stuff here. Share screen. That'll be it. Oh, yeah. There you go. Hey, there it is. Rosanna's fun fact. Hey, welcome back, hey. Rosanna, for another hey. absolutely wonderful fun fact, as she always has, and always so timely. So, Rosanna writes uh, Hi, Paul. The weekend storm seems to be suffering from a case of abdulumania, a bowl or mania, a pathological inability to make a decision. It just couldn't seem to make up its mind whether it was intent on provoking or providing rain, ice pellets, snow or freezing rain, or at least in Apahawk, it certainly kept changing. One thing I did provide, 
One thing it did provide consistently was defrosted and slushy windshields uh, and the steps. On Earth, frost happens when water molecules in the atmosphere freeze directly into ice on cold surfaces. In May, uh, ESA, or ESA's Mars Express Orbiter captured this view of a white frost and reddish regolith. Oh, let's see if I get my start working. There we go. Um, uh, where did I go? Uh, lost where I was. That was uh, freezing. Yeah, uh, the reddish regolith around a crater in the uh, Ultimi Scopuli region near the South Pole. The frost in this photo comes from mostly from water vapor. Regolith is the layer of unconsolidated rocky material covering bedrock. Well, it's really interesting uh, stuff to see. Now, however, Mars is also home to carbon dioxide frost, which has a beautiful blue hue to it, which is right there. Oh, sorry, let me go back one. And that frost can be found at the poles. Now these frost uh, on these sand dunes is dry ice frost. Most from carbon dioxide is created in Mars frigid temperatures, which plunge to minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit. Unlike our water frost at home, Mars carbon dioxide frost doesn't melt. Instead, when the temperatures warm above one, minus 190 degrees Fahrenheit, it converts directly from a solid to a gas in a shift called sublimation. In the process, fantastic formations are created on the ground, ranging from spider-like intertwining lines to scattered polka dots. And that's where, whoops, sorry, go the right way here. Boop, there we go. So it comes up with things that look like that. It's really quite interesting when you really look at them. The freezing of water ice and sublimation, sublimation of dry ice create these patterns on Mars ground. Geysers uh, of sun warm gas and dust are shown in blue in this enhanced color image. This is from the NAT, one of uh, NASA's shots. It's really just unbelievable. Now, through Frosty the Snowman, or sorry, though Frosty the Snowman hasn't really made uh, much of an appearance so far this winter, a, frost, a frosty visitor did arrive for the holidays and has been becoming more and more interesting as it nears Earth throughout January and February. Although Comet 2022E3ZTF was first spotted in March, it became much easier to capture in telescopes in our northern hemisphere in December. Um, this fabulous shot was, whoops, and I don't know if I have it. No, actually, you know what? I didn't get it. Um, I did have a shot of it. And for some reason, it did not pop over. But in any event, there's all kinds of pictures of the uh, of that comment on the internet. Um, so that one, the one that we were going to see was actually taken on Christmas Eve by an astrophotographer, which I haven't been able to show you. C2023ES, which doesn't have a catchy nickname yet, began its long journey in the far out reaches of the solar system within the Oort cloud. The comet will make its closest approach to the sun or reach perihelion on January 12th, uh, which is past, when it comes to within 1.1 astronomical units of our star. After rounding the sun, C2023E3 will continue to grow brighter through the end of the month, and the comet's brightness is predicted to peak around February the 1st, when it makes its closest approach to Earth by passing within 0.28 astronomical units of our planet. At this point, many observers and astrophotographers hope C2023 ES3, or E3 rather, will reach naked eye magnitudes as it skims through a particularly rich region of the sky near the Northern Pole, setting the scene for some gorgeous photos. Now, even, if, even at its brightest, however, Comet 220, C2022 E3 is not expected to form a bright long tail that's visible without a telescope. But even without a tail, a comet will be a memorable sight. Plus, comets can always surprise us with unexpected outbursts so it's worth following this comet's progress to see what in fact it will do. And this comet is not expected to return for another 
50,000 years. So I suspect a lot of us will have a few more wrinkles by then. So this is truly once in a lifetime chance to see. Now, what I've charted here is basically the comet's um, uh, uh, position since January um, the 14th. And as you can see, as it progresses through time, it's gonna go across the star and right around the 30th, 31st, uh, and into the second and third, it's gonna be near um, the pole star. And then of course, it'll slide right on down uh, through to Aldebaran a little bit further uh, in his course as to what we're gonna see. So that uh, I think is primarily what Rosanna had for this week. And that was this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rosanna. I appreciate that. Um, uh, to be, what happened in this particular segment tonight was I didn't get all the photographs that they wouldn't open for me, so I had to go find some. And so, Rosanna, I apologize, and uh, but I think I captured the ones that you uh, wanted to use. So thank you. Absolutely, great Again, story. Anyway, great stuff. And yep. I had no idea of all what goes on with Mars and mm. how the frost uh, turns uh, to what it does. Mm. Uh, it's quite different than what it is here on uh, on Earth. So anyway, cool. She always has great information. Absolutely. Those two are related as well, the Mars and the comet, because they can February when it's going through Taurus, it might be within the binocular view. The comet and Mars may be the same view. Yes. Wow. Certainly yes. for some of them, Paul might want to take a picture of her mic. That'd be right. cool. Yeah. What about me? And you too. <laughs> we really know we're going to cloud these guys. <laughs> yeah. I'd try it, but it's hard to stack Polaroids. So. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm excited about it. I'm, I'm, all the neighbors here out where I'm at are talking about it. So uh, reading mm -hmm. around that, if we get some good skies between, you know, say the first and the third or whatever, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to take some scopes and set them up here in the cul-de-sac of the neighborhood and, and uh, show some. Uh, around the 10th or 11th, isn't it, Kirk, that is in uh, Taurus? I, I don't know. Uh, Paul just had it there in the map. Yeah. Yeah, sometime around in February. 10th, 11, I think around the uh, 31st and the 1st, I think it's around Polaris, close to Polaris, but yeah. whether they're in the same field of view and binoculars, I'm not sure. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Great. Yeah, it's exciting stuff. Okay. Um, we're moving right along here. Uh, let's go along with the what's up then, maybe next. I'll share my screen. And we should be able to do it this way, I think. <clears throat> How's that? Yep. <laughs> there we go. What's up this week? Eh, you know. But, you know, I did look at the Environment Canada page just uh, basically before we come on air here, and here's what we kind of ended up with. So uh, maybe some hope for Wednesday, maybe Thursday. Who knows? Fingers crossed. Just cloudy periods for Tuesday night now. So I said, well, I wasn't going to do what's up at all, but then they saw that. So I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll try one. We'll see what happens. So um, this is something Kurt does at our St. John Astronomy Club meetings quite often. Uh, he provides a, a nice, nice sky chart like this. This one comes from Heavens Above uh, website, heavens-above.com. Uh, and this is showing our sky uh, tonight at 9 p.m. Be, uh, behind the clouds. Uh, here's Orion down here uh, in the southeast, uh, rising up now nicely by 9 p.m. Uh, here's Canis Major and Canis Minor right there, was Kurt was talking about earlier. This is part of the winter circle, of course, too, or the winter football. Um, so we talk from Gem from Gemini here across to Auriga and down through to uh, Taurus and then straight down to the, the bottom of Orion and, and across again to Sirius and then back up again. So there's your there's your circle. Uh, very big chunk of sky, very prominent in the sky uh, in the evening. Um, we also have Mars here sitting very close to Taurus right now or in Taurus, I guess. Uh, and this is where the comet's going to be running by uh, in uh, late late month, I'll say, around 10 p.m. Jupiter's still here above the horizon, even at 9 p.m. Um, Venus is is slowly rising in our evening sky. Uh, it's going to have a nice meetup with uh, Saturn on the 22nd of the month. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, the big square Pegasus, of course, hanging around in the, uh, in the northwest part of the sky as well. 
count two stars out and two stars up, and you can get it right into Andromeda Galaxy right in there. Next closest galaxy, large, gal large galaxy to ours. Find the odd is easy if you look at this W of Cassiopeia, and the second part of the W points straight down to it. So there are two ways to find it easy enough. So that's our evening sky. There's the big and little dipper over this end of the sky. And we're going to take a swing back to what we would see in our morning sky. This is our 6 a.m. view, or 5, 5 a.m. maybe. Um, here we have uh, our summer constellations coming up in the morning uh, in the daytime sky. So there's Cygnus popping back up again. Yay, Paul. <laughs> there's, there's Lyra. We've got Hercules, our other summertime in Boonies. Um, Corona Borealis is right here. So here's about where the comet is right now, right in this part of the sky right now. And it's going to be going in this direction over the next, uh, right in this direction, I guess, over the next couple of weeks. Um, but that'll be in our evening sky. We'll catch that around 10 p.m. About another week or so, we'll have it at midnight. And then uh, a week after that, within a week after that, it should be up at uh, around 10 p.m. And here's our spring constellations as well, Leo um, and Virgo. We'll take a look at those a little bit later on. Uh, a little bit more about the comet. Here's the view from uh, the site called theskylive.com. I do go in here fairly often to take a look at comets and, and what, because they have a lot of information about the comet itself. Um, it's perihelion, it's closest approach to earth, uh, megs right now that they're talking about that kind of thing. So here's its position right now relative to um, us. So it's already past the sun and uh, it's swinging down this way. And this is where we're going to see it uh, shortly. Uh, so if we look now at uh, Tuesday, we'll say just Tuesday uh, on the 17th at midnight, there's where its position would be uh, in between Draco and Boonies, right in that part of the sky. Still fairly low, uh, but if we go ahead now to the 24th, you can see that's climbing up pretty quickly. Uh, that's at 10 p.m. now, so and then it becomes a circumpolar um, comet, so you, it'll be up all night long. Uh, so we have all evening to take a look at it. And we're still hoping for some brightness, you know, with it for sure. So we don't really don't know. I mean, we've got another couple of weeks before it gets... Uh, it gets to uh, our closest approach to Earth. And then after that is when we get to see the tail a little bit longer as well, uh, as we change our view towards the, the comet. Uh, so it might yet prove out to be something worth uh, seeing in, a, in an evening sky with, with naked eye. Binoculars, though, for sure, and uh, small telescopes. Um, now we're swing over here to uh, the ISS. This is our, our week and two, I guess the next two weeks coming up with the ISS. Uh, lots of nice passes, um, minus 3.3, minus 3.8, minus 3.7. Those are almost as bright as Venus, I guess. Um, so they would be some nice passes uh, throughout the week. These are evening sky passes now. Uh, what I try to do is I look at the highest point. So here's the highest point. Um, if I see this one, like uh, there's one that's 71 degrees. That's pretty, that's pretty high up over top. So that's on the 20th. Um, if you haven't seen these before, this is what you go to uh, heavens above, heavens-above.com and up in the top right hand corner, you're going to uh, change your location to your location, in my case it would be St. John, and then look down through the list of, uh, of uh, objects that you can look at and find ISS and click on it and this brings up all this information. Now once you click on one of these links, it brings you to a picture like this. So this gives you the exact position and it, they are very, very uh, accurate, I find. Um, gives you the exact position where it's going to be in the sky and what at what point uh, it's going to be across the sky at what time. So uh, this one doesn't complete the whole pass. In other words, you won't see it all, go all the way from horizon to horizon. But it all depends on what's happening with the, the solar panels on the ISS. So always a nice thing to to enjoy yourself and bring the kids out, take a look at it. Um, something else that's been happening lately, not quite as nicely. <laughs> uh, this is Blue Walker 3. So this is a new uh, satellite, I'll call it, um, that is uh, starting to peak up in brightness. Um, this is Blue Walker 3, which is the third one of their test uh, satellites. Um, and I'm gonna show you a picture of it here in a second. We're gonna look at January 24th at magnitude 2.5. Uh, that's almost as bright as Polaris now. Um, so it's getting to be a concern for some astronomers because here's the size of it. This is what it looks like. So Blue Walker 3 is AST Space Mobile's prototype satellite. The spacecraft was built to establish connectivity directly with cell phones via 3GPPP 
uh, standard frequencies. Uh, Blue Walker 3 launched to orbit on September the 10th, 2022, and is a pre predecessor now to planned commercial satellites called Bluebirds. Now, unfurled, it's more than 26 feet per side, or about 8 meters per side, and it can be as bright as the brightest stars around first magnitude, uh, according to the IAU. Um, Blue Walker 3 is currently the largest commercial communication satellite in low Earth orbit. Uh, Blue Walker's maker, AST Space Mobile, plans to launch more than 100 larger satellites called Bluebirds, similar in this style. These satellites could be more than twice as bright, twice the size of Blue, Blue Walker 3 and much brighter as well. So more satellite constellations coming and these are big ones. Uh, and here's its path uh, on January 24th. So you'll be able to pass it, uh, catch it, uh, come out at 1902, I guess, Atlantic time straight across and passes right by the star in Orion. Bellatrix, I guess right in front of it. So we'll keep an eye out on that one. Saturday, uh, we've got our new moon. New moon, begins a, a new moon begins a new lunar cycle on Saturday at 4.53 p.m. Atlantic time. It's also the time when the moon will be at its closest approach to us called perigee. In fact, it'll be the closest new moon for a few years. Uh, astronomers love the time around the new moon because they can enjoy views of those distant fuzzy objects without being hampered by the light of the moon. Now remember, there is no dark side of the moon. The moon receives the same amount of sunlight on all parts within a month. In this case, the side facing away from us, the far side over here, is uh, totally illuminated by the sun. So that's why we call it a new moon. <laughs> and Saturday, uh, the conjunction of Venus and Saturn. Excuse me. This is one uh, another nice celestial event, guaranteed clear skies for. Um, so this is next uh, uh, Sunday, it says it should be, uh, yes, this should be Sunday, sorry. Uh, catch the dazzling planet Venus and the much fainter planet Saturn near each other after sunset. And they'll start looking near where the sun has just set. As a bonus, you might spot the young waxing crescent moon closer to the horizon. Uh, the sliver of crescent moon will set about 30 minutes before the planets. Then the planets will disappear over the horizon roughly 90 minutes after sunset. Uh, the closest to Venus will pass uh, within 0.4 of a degree, which is almost the width of the full moon from Saturn. So really nice, bright Venus, a lot dimmer Saturn, but they'll be very, very close from our point of view. Uh, here they are. Actually, of course, they're doing a little bit of a celestial dance over the next uh, couple of weeks. As Venus uh, gets higher and Saturn gets a little bit lower each night. So here they are uh, tomorrow evening. And uh, here they are on Wednesday, the view on Wednesday, you can see Venus getting up a little bit higher. And there they are on the 22nd, next Sunday. Now also, um, the thin crescent moon will join the two planets, but for a brief time on the 22nd, a better view of our crescent moon, Venus and Jupiter will, uh, or sorry, Venus and uh, Saturn will come on the following night. So we'll have the waxing crescent moon, Venus and Saturn all lined up there nicely at 6.15, which is right around dark. And of course, uh, all week long and all month long, uh, the evening planet parade continues. So there's still a great show happening right now in the evening sky with the parade of planets, similar to what uh, we experienced back in the spring. All the naked eye planets, except for Mercury, are visible in the early evening. And the two telescope targets of Uranus and Neptune can also be seen right now. Venus and Saturn have a close pairing coming up on the 22nd of the month. So. Uh, we still should be able to get that for at least another week. And I um, always like to bring up uh, Lisa's look up, uh, Lisa Fanning's uh, nice chart that she puts together every month. Uh, this is her chart for January. Um, in her chart, she lists the events here on the left-hand side. Uh, then the dates are listed here. She picks the peak time, when's the best time to view that particular event, and what you need, if you're a naked eye, binoculars, or a telescope. So lays that out very nicely. And she says, keep watching C22E3 uh, ZTF. May become bright enough to see unaided in the dark sky. We'll see. So uh, Lisa's look up astronomy and more is where you can find her. You can find her at Ruby Moonbeam, Ruby Moonbeams on Instagram, Twitter, Mastodon, and Facebook. And also, um, this is our, our uh, monthly calendar, January, February. Kurt Nason here puts this together for us. Every month does a great job on it. Everything on here is uh, listed. Any any major event or any minor event is going to be listed on here for the, uh, the following six weeks, I guess, as it's listed as, up to February 18th. 
Uh, at the top, he lists uh, Jupiter's red spot transit times. So he has, uh, you can see the red spot here, a number of places throughout the chart. So if you want to catch the red spot, you've never seen it. These are the times to pick it out. Uh, uh, just below that, he has all of the uh, moons, the Galilean moons of Jupiter, um, Io, Europa, Ganymede, Callisto, all listed. And then these terms, eclipse and transit and shadow transit, uh, these are terms that are listed here as well. So we have points when the moon gets passed in the front of, uh, in behind Jupiter's shadow or pops out the other side of his shadow. Uh, there are times when the moons are transiting across the face of the planet and dragging the shadow behind them. So there's lots of that happening uh, through many times throughout the month here. Um, so that's the chart that you want to find. Go to sjastronomy.ca to get a copy of that or raskandb.ca where we can also get it. So that's what I get to say about that there. There you go. Here, that's what's coming up, I guess. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I just lost the monitor. <laughs> Maybe I didn't. Maybe I did. No, there it is. It's back. Whew. Okay. <laughs> um, from there, I guess I wanted to go to some photos. So bear with me for a second. I'll see if I can get those up and running. And I'll start them over here. Just moving things around a little bit. Okay, let me share my screen once more. We'll just uh, share this one, I guess, and bring them over. No. No, they went to the wrong screen, of course. Let's try this. There you go. Got it now? Okay, perfect. All right. Um, <laughs> now something covered up in my comments. Just a minute. <laughs> Well, all right. Uh, this one comes from Dwayne Schwamm. Uh, Dwayne says, from my backyard this summer, uh, we were start. of course, a lot of the pictures are, are older pictures because we haven't had any clear sky. Lately, so. We were stargazing to the southeast, he said, and my son said, look, Dad, and pointing to the north. He turned around to see Aurora. It was a nice surprise. Now, this was taken in Regina, Saskatchewan. So, oh, nice done, Dwayne. Beautiful. Mm. Thanks for that. And... Uh, Emma V. Emma sent this one in. Emma V. Uh, Sun dogs and halo this morning. She said January thirteenth in Moncton. Yes, sir. Nice shot. Nice. Got yeah. the sun locked in. Well, well done, done, Emma. That's a good idea to keep the uh, sun from taking over the picture. So you can see yeah. It. And all that moisture, right? Yeah. Very nice. You see, it that's now. a large sundial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <right. laughs> Thanks, Emma. Uh, we're going to go to Trudy now. Trudy Allman. Uh, she said, here's the parade of planets at sunset in December. Um, so there they are. Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Mercury, cool. Venus. Look at that. Cool. And, and the moon, yeah. Wow, nice. Well done. Now she said, I also shot this at sunrise uh, back in June. We included that one as well. well there they are again. Mercury, Venus, and the other order. <laughs> wow. Mercury, Jupiter, and Saturn. Cool. Nicely done. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, she says, and since I've shot lots of sunrise photos with Split Rock, here is a sunset one from Split Rock. More of these to come once it gets warmer, she said. Oh. Yeah. Uh, that's a great place out there. Mm, very nice. Thanks, Trudy. Okay, uh, Andre uh, Chinook is on here. She said, you asked for some sunset set photos. I did, sunrise, sunset, whatever. So she said, so I'm sending you a bunch of them. Uh, these are taken at our home in Mesa's Bay. Every night is a little different, she said. They are, they are never two the same. Let me see, give me a few of them here. Beautiful. Enjoy. Oh, yeah. That's gorgeous. Those, uh, those colors like that in the sky. Hmm. Nice to have some clouds. There you go. No mosquitoes there, eh? Not there at all, no. <laughs> <laughs> a nice moonshot that she sent in as well. Thanks, Audrey, for those. Very nice. <clears throat> Excuse me. Frog in my throat tonight. Okay, I'm um, going to go from there to uh, David Hoskins. Uh, 
we captured this image of Messier 35 and its neighbor, NGC 2158. Uh, Messier 35 is a large open star cluster that's uh, 2,970 light years from Earth. Uh, it's about 24 light years in diameter and about 110 million years old. Um, and GC 2158 is 11,000 light years from us. It's about 17 light years in diameter and 2 billion years old. But these star clusters are located in the constellation of Gemini, which is up nice and proudly this time of year at this time of night. Sure. Yeah. Nice shot. Yeah. Nice shot. Can you zoom in on that for a sec, the tight, the tight cluster? Pardon me? Can you zoom in on that tight cluster? Yep. Yeah, there. So you can see, uh, Kurt, you can certainly attest to all the different color stars that you see there. And uh, of course, they give way to uh, identifying, I would assume, their uh, age and, uh, and whatnot. Would that be correct, Kurt? Hmm. That's correct. So with all those var varied colors, that's the nice thing about images like those. If you can shoot them with short enough exposures, you, those colors will come out. And then you can identify what's the new hot stars and what's sort of midlife stars and and, uh, and maybe some of the older ones as well. Mm, lots of color. Nice shot. Yeah, it is. Very good shot. Thanks, David. Um, I'm going to skip now over to Jason Dane. This incredible shot. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Uh, M51A and M51B are a pair of interacting galaxies in the constellation of Canis Benetici. Benetici. Its uh, distance from Earth is estimated to be about 31 million light years. Now, these spiral nebula were not recognized as galaxies until Edwin Hubble was able to observe Cepheid variables in some of these spiral nebula, which provided evidence that they were so far away that they must be entirely separate galaxies. This is 34 hours of integration time. Wow, nice shot. Well, look at the galaxies around it. I mean, the M51 is gorgeous for sure, but yeah. look at Look at all the galaxies that are around that galaxy. Yeah, here and here. There's yeah. there's so so many. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And he's got that the flux in there too. That red that light cloud that you see that's in there. Yeah. Yeah, right down yeah, that yeah. bottom left corner. Yeah, yeah. all of that. All through most, that. Yeah. Most, most people miss that, but you gotta you gotta image that for a while to get that stuff to come out. That's a really nice shot. It's an amazing shot. Yeah. Yeah. Great shot, Jason. Okay, um, move on to Chris Benoit here. Chris, uh, this is Sadr, uh, the Gamma Cyg Cygni star in the Cygnus constellation. Um, there's an SWSA tripod, uh, Canon 50, 450D with astronomic H alpha filter and intervalometer, 10 second intervals, ISO 800, celestron refractor, 80, 80 AZS, uh, F5 at 400 uh, millimeter, and a Batnoff mask. Very nice. Nice shot. No. Very nice job. Thanks, Chris. I'm going to go with Kathy Adams here now. So just a quick shot tonight. This is the first half a, a decent look at Orion and the Flame Nebula. I've had this winter. She <laughs> said uh, <laughs> Sony A6000 a and a Samyang uh, 135 millimeter. So certainly not uh, tonight. <laughs> yeah. Well nice done. capture, though, to get both of them in the same field of view. Yeah, absolutely. She does says great photos. Yeah, that's shot. Right. And if you'd like to send in your photos, you can send them into astronomybythebay at gmail.com. We love to get them. Um, I think that was about it. Yep, that's it. And let me stop sharing here. Well, Kurt, uh, Paul Crowder was asking if uh, you could recommend an easy uh, read book on constellations in Greek mythology. Yeah, I think I showed them before. There's a little classic from 1912, Star Lord, I want to tell her And what I use a lot is uh, patterns, uh, new patterns of the sky by uh, Julius Stahl. And both of those are available on, on Amazon. And even on the internet, uh, you look them up, maybe the story's on there as well. Yeah. That answers your question, Paul. <laughs> Great, thanks. I did have one other photo, I'm sorry. Uh, there was one other one that was shared late in the day. So I'm just gonna bring that up here for a second. Um, it's- uh, Seen that one before. Oh yeah, yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. 
Here, let's try this one. Yeah, so this was uh, shared from the Full Moon Observers Group. Uh, he said it's raining in Southern California. So here's a close-up pick from July 22 from the Full, Full Moon Observers Group page. So they have yes, a group sir. page here too that follow us as well. So just yeah. want to say shout out to them. Thanks for really nice. that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> oh, hang on. We'll stop sharing. Here we go. There you go. All right, we're back. Okay, it looks like uh, <clears throat> it's going to be our evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, so, anyway, in closing tonight, we'd like to thank Kurt for joining us this evening. Kurt. Thanks, Kurt. Yay! 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 So our special thanks again uh, to Rosanna for continued contributions to our program. Thank you, Rosanna, as always. We really do appreciate it. And we uh, thank all of you once again, too, for uh, your continued support of our efforts here. Uh, we also hope that all of you enjoyed this from uh, Rogers. Enjoyed the program tonight. If you would like more information about the wonders of the night sky, you can contact me at astronomybythebay.ca. Also, special thanks to all of you who share our program. We really do appreciate it. And remember, we do love getting your photos. So send them in to astronomybythebay at gmail.com. And we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. If you have a suggestion for a topic for a future show, please let us know at the same address. And please let your friends and family know that we will be back here next Sunday evening at 8 p.m. on YouTube and Facebook to edutain you on astronomy and the wonders of the night sky. So for now, then, from Kurt, Mike, Paul, and I, wish you all a very safe and happy week, everybody. Lots of clear skies. Uh, as we like to say, guys, open your eyes to view the skies and keep your scopes. Point it up. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Good night. That's your cue, Paul. A little louder. Here we go. <laughs>